aspects of running a bar, how your, how your spirit cupboard's organized, like how, how you're creative in putting this together, how your menu looks. And I think all, all facets of your team can, can have an input in that. And like, how does the lighting look? How you, are you creative in your lighting? How does, how does the room feel when you arrive? Everything's creative throughout the whole, whole business, I think. Luke? Um, yes, uh, <laughs> I, I agree with like a, a earlier point. Like, uh, uh, so some of my junior guys uh, at Operation Dagger have really blossomed in the last say year or so, and um, they started learning, you know, how to be a little bit more creative. To the point now, it's like I'll say, you know, for instance, if I use our latest menu for an example, I said, okay, I want to make a, a coconut wine. I think it should have this, 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 and all parts of the coconut. Here you go. And she just grabbed the ball and ran with it because she's sort of uh, spent enough time with, with me working underneath me now to, to understand the sort of quality of, of product we want to deliver. And now she's just really blossomed. It's amazing to see. Um, and then also in other smaller things, like, like the guys are saying as well, like I'll, I'll come forward with a recipe and say, okay, this is, this is a drink or whatever. If someone comes to me and says, oh, I've got a quicker way of doing this or maybe we get more flavor out of this and whatever, yeah, I'm all for it. So that also, it's, it's being creative in the way of just being more efficient. And then like really basic stuff like, you know, storage of things and your, your mise en place and your daily Excel spreadsheets of task sheets and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, there's definitely more than one way to, to skin a cat, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, since I uh, quit my last job, uh, the biggest lear thing I learned was uh, actually not to be afraid to ask, uh, because uh, I went from being uh, in a fairly senior role into something, actually I have no fucking clue about opening a bar. And uh, you know, it's about like what, 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 what makes you better or more creative is being actually able to go to the finance person and say, I don't understand this line on P&L, what does it actually mean? Uh, you know, when I quit my job, uh, I was always fascinated by what these guys were doing with the Rotavap. So I went, uh, you know, bought my Rotavap, asked Matt if I could come and learn from him, you know, like having the, uh, you know, you need to stay on the ground, you know, it, it, it's good to admit that you don't know. Mm. And the thing is as well, Alex, like you really changed the status quo in the last place you were working. You're working in a five-star hotel and what did people think when you brought in a slushy machine? Yeah, I mean, at the beginning, uh, nobody was having it. I mean, yeah. I, told, I told this story a million times. Uh, we had this idea to make a piña colada, the Bacardi. <laughs> And uh, nobody was having it from the management. Everybody thought it was a, was a, was a bullshit. Uh, and for me, it was about questioning them, you know, like uh, show me one of the hotel manuals which says you cannot have a slushy machine if slushy machine is the best way how to make, make a frozen drink. Yeah. And it uh, was funny uh, to see all the, all the mid-management, which is always the biggest pain in the ass, uh, you know, who then pride themselves, you know. It was like... Uh, it was like they done the, whole, done the whole thing. So I think it's about asking questions, you know? Why does it uh, have to be do this way? Now I think a slushy machine, I mean, in New Orleans has always been a standard thing, <laughs> but in Europe uh, necessarily wasn't. So it's about asking questions, you know? Yeah. So like in the, in the interview process, um, I asked everybody what their thought process was when creating a cocktail or a concept. And Luke like, uh, answered, I'm just not sure if I'm structured or methodical. So I guess it's, it's open, you can work either way. And what about the rest of the panel? Let's start you, Nathan. Are you structured? Do you have your systems in place? Uh, no, I mean, mine just comes from a number of places. It depends. Like, sometimes it can be just, like, being in an art gallery and seeing something, like a Jackson Pollock painting, and, like, it can be as random as that word. I don't even know how to describe it, but you just see something there that brings something, and it's like, okay, I can make a drink, not necessarily based on what it looks like, but what I interpret it to be. Uh, and then there's other parts where it's just like, I'm around amazing people or other bars or wherever it's in uh, like great restaurants and a dish might just simply inspire me just because of the actual flavors that are there. But I don't ever try and manipulate directly what that is. It's more kind of like that's the thought process where it starts to get going. Yeah. Um, I'm also very fortunate as well that at the Nomad we have research and development sessions every Tuesday whereby 
every single member of staff will turn up and put ideas forwards and this can be anybody from bar back to floor staff right the way up to like head bartenders to beverage director and every single person will have an input in that drink and have an input on like the actual focus of it and a direction that might start really simply can turn into something completely different by the end but it always is in the same kind of character that the drink is the focal point for that nice what about you matt i actually think um having structure limits your capabilities of what you can be creatively um and if you if you narrow it down your you the space where you can be creative is, is much smaller i think the only time we're actually um, structured is we just we will decide what we want something to taste like before we've actually even started making a drink and then we'll worry about how we get the flavors in afterwards so um, before we move on to the next section um, I, during my research came across something quite interesting like ancients and Romans and ancient Greeks believed that creativity was a divine power, higher power or a spirit that came to humans from un, from some unknown reason they didn't think it came from humans Greek called them daemons like Socrates Romans called them a genius, supposedly lived in the walls of an artist's studio, shaping the outcome of the paintings or sculptures. And then as soon as the Renaissance happened, people stopped believing in mythical creatures and that creativity came from within. The phrase uh, creative people is redundant. It's like we are essentially all creative, it's a human process. So, Alex, let's start with you, mate. Tell me about um, your sources of inspiration. I think uh, I really agree with, uh, with Matt, uh, despite I also believe in uh, actually having a structure in it. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, I mean, anything you do in the terms of creative work, no matter whether it's the lighting, the smell of the room, or the organization of the, of the mise en place, it's all based uh, on your experiences. Mm -hmm. So the, the richer life uh, you lead, uh, the more things you expose, uh, expose yourself to, uh, you know, the, the better. And I think often it's about uh, like what does it mean to understand something uh, it's about changing and shifting a perspective you know mm -hmm. if you are able uh, to look at uh, an issue from many different perspectives yeah. uh, that's probably when you really start to get a good understanding yeah what what about you luke what are your thoughts on that uh mike what were we talking about creativity <laughs> um yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I one of my weaker points actually is being is being structured and organised. So I, I think that's a good thing for people to to realise your strong points and your weak points. Like coming up with with ideas and whatever is is not my problem. It's structuring them and channeling them. And it took me a little while to to sort of uh, get a, a, a decent template for that. Uh, and now I sort of I force myself at some points to be structured because I know that that's not my strong point. Um, and that's what I've found I get the best results out of. So yeah, I think it's that you, I agree with Matt, you can be too structured. Um, but yeah, when it's like, uh, that's not my problem. It's like, I, I need some structure. Um, the ideas are always coming. It's just how to channel them into an end product and, you know, make them, uh, you know, appear on the menu, but not even just that, you know, making them cost effective and, and all that sort of thing. That's, that's what I struggle with. So I, I do at some point force myself to have a bit of structure um, to achieve that. I think um, one of the other sort of main sources of uh, inspiration for everybody on the panel is uh, cross-pollination. Everybody over there has had experience working with chefs and still enjoys a very close relationship to that. And Luke raised a very good point earlier. It's uh, only reading bartenders' books can only see what's been done before. Whereas if you look at other industries, um, it can opens up a completely different thought process. So Alex, I know you've had experience working with glass makers before. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you'd like to elaborate a little bit, please. Yeah, no, uh, I think uh, when you're working on the projects which are more, more complex, uh, when you talk about drink, you know, are you developing only the liquid or are you developing the entire concept? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge difference in that. And uh, often uh, you don't know uh, all the pieces of the puzzle, but the people from other disciplines uh, can, uh, you know, can, can help you to do that. And I think you're going to be tasting uh, one of the cocktail beers uh, we, we brought for you. I work with a brewery called uh, Partizan Brewing from, from London, and we, just, like, we, we, we go with Andy, who owns the brewery for drinks, and we always drink beer and a Negroni, so one day we had an idea, we should make like a Negroni-inspired beer. 
So uh, we made like a beer uh, which has been brewed and cold infused with botanicals of uh, gin, Campari and vermouth. We dyed it with a cochineal insect as well, so it's red uh, when you serve it. And that gave a rise to a series of beers we done uh, now for the summer in Europe, uh, lychee and uh, rose martini saison. You're gonna be tasting the white Russian imperial stout and it's like, I actually don't know about brewing beers, uh, but you know, working together, mm. uh, you know, can gi uh, can give uh, nice ideas because equally, Andy knows fuck all about cocktails, but yeah. it's about being open and doing yeah. things together. So you create a truly unique uh, concept. And what you're actually drinking at the moment, it was something that um, was discovered by accidents. Accidents do happen, and it's about realizing that it is an accident and it's still great. So Luke, tell us about your dirty martini that everyone's enjoying. So. <laughs> Uh, so this one is, it came about, like Joe said, by accident. I was in London and there was like a bit of a, do you call it a heat wave <laughs> in one London? Day, one day, it was yeah. one day. Um, I was just stuck in the middle of Hackney and uh, I was just like stifled by the heat and I just needed to like nip into a pub and just, I just wanted a cold beer. So I, um, my, my fiance and I, we just nipped into the Marksman pub and uh, I just basically walked up to the pub and said, and there's some old, old codger there like, sipping on some ale. And I said, I'll have what he's having. And the beer came down, I didn't even think, and I just downed it. And it was like a warm pint of beer, like from the pumps. And like, I'm Australian, so yeah, beer has to be cold, you know? <laughs> and I nearly threw up. And, uh, but then, so I sat down and I had like this really quite hoppy uh, beer after that. And then we had like a bowl of olives or whatever. And I was eating these olives and with the, I don't know what it was, like the, the combination of the hops and the caramel in the beer or something like that. Uh, or oh, sorry, the hops and the malt in the beer, and then the olive. There was this weird combination, really cool combination of like salty, savory, but then this caramel sweetness coming through. Um, and I, I always thought that was cool. So I literally in my phone just wrote hops, caramel, malt, olive. Uh, then when I went back to Singapore, started playing with the ideas, and the first sort of template that sort of jumped out to me was a dirty martini. Um, so this is like, uh, it's pretty simple actually. It's just, um, just we use Bombay Sapphire, um, we've made like a caramel with malt and hops um, and infused that uh, sous vide out with some blended up whole green olives. We've infused that sous vide and then uh, basically freeze it and then filter it overnight. Um, and then it's served really simply in the bar um, just over a big block of ice. Um, and then we serve like layers of grapes on the top of the, looks a little bit, uh, <laughs> more presentable than this but uh, so what the idea is you eat the grape which sort of represents the vermouth of the martini um, and then you drink so when you have the grape it sort of resets everything and that sort of ties everything together so yeah it was kind of a happy accident I guess and I find that happens quite a lot you know I'll, I'll have a dish at a restaurant um, it happened also to me in, in London I was uh, with Matt and we ate at the typing room and uh, Lee Westcott, one of the chefs, the head chef there, had this amazing dish of lardo, sorrel, and green strawberries. And it was like one of the best things I've tasted in a long time. And so I ended up working that into a drink as well. Um, so I think you just, just to be open to those sort of happy accidents and just open to new ideas. So like going back to that other point of if your head's just buried in a classic cocktail book the whole time, where are you going to get new flavors coming from? You're not. So I think that's, it's really important to just open yourself up to ideas. And like Nathan was saying, it doesn't have to always be about bartending. Get out and do, do other things. I remember the thing with the glassmakers. <laughs> oh, I, I just remember the thing with the glassmakers. Oh, yeah? Uh, <laughs> like talking about accidents. Uh, so I'm, I'm sitting in a meeting and I realized that the technical rowing had a wrong measurement, which is kind of an issue if you just ordered 1,000 glasses. And... <laughs> Uh, and well, you know, so I didn't say anything to anyone because uh, it's a lot of money. So I was like, which is going to figure it out? And it was a glass basically which had two components uh, which were like sat on the top of each other. And uh, when it came and we unpacked it to, uh, to test it and to try to find a solution, we actually realized that thanks to the glass maker getting the wrong measurement, the glass actually uh, worked. That's your, that's your story, <laughs> the happy ending. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> So, like, Matt, something you've touched on earlier was um, looking towards your team for creative input. Like, how do you, uh, is there anything in particular to do to nurture that creativity and lay the foundations so people feel safe to come forward? I think, 
I think the main thing is like letting them, letting any of your team, whether they're a bar back or a manager, come to you and and put forward any idea. And I don't think any idea is a shit idea. It just might not work at that at that time. And as long as everyone keeps coming in with ideas, they're always there's always going to be good ones coming along. We used to have a a waitress who came with an idea of this drink with um, charred artichokes, and she she was like, no, it's a shit idea. I don't want to do it anymore. And actually, as a team, we all added input into the drink and it actually became one of the best drinks we've ever made. Oh, nice. So, um, again, like, there's these people called Big C Creatives. You're looking at the Steve Jobs, Michelangelo of the world. And these guys actually have had teams and teams of people working for them. Instead of just taking all their, coming up with all the ideas, they act as almost like a film director, driving people towards their vision. And the term, like, creative genius is essentially nonsense. It's all about the teamwork and the people that you're surrounded by. The term, well, the, the concept of making like Michelangelo, like a world famous uh, artist, was down to a 16th century PR guy called Nassari. So don't necessarily believe the hype. So um, Nathan, describe the environment of your workplace. I know you're very methodical in terms of uh, the setups, mise en place and teamwork. Um, yeah, I mean, for us, it's, it's very much about the team. It starts pretty much from the company at the top. Uh, our company is actually owned, it's the same owners as 11 Madison Park, so I'm very fortunate in the fact that I have Will Gadara and Chef Daniel Hume uh, to kind of lean on at any point. They, having people at the very top of the company who are not afraid of taking risks, for instance, 11 Madison Park won the world's best restaurant this year, and we just closed it two months ago to go and move it out to the Hamptons. So in the year that we won the world's best restaurant, we actually shut it down so people can't visit it. Uh, to kind of redo it all over again. Um, and it's going to be completely different when it reopens. It's a brand new restaurant, a complete new idea behind it. Having that thought process from there trickles down to every single member of staff as far as culture goes within the company. Uh, and it happens with us in the bar as well. Like Every single person is willing to take the risk, whether it's to do with drinks or whether it's to do with the structure. We're always kind of questioning what we're going to do next. Uh, and the idea behind that is we never want to become stagnated. Uh, we want to keep pushing forwards. And as well, we want people to be excited. So every time they come to Nomad, they get a brand new experience. We, uh, we recently just actually opened a thing called Tachi Nomad, which is we have this beautiful alleyway at the back of, a, the back of a, our kitchen, which nobody knows about. It's actually a fire escape, so we probably shouldn't be telling you this. Um, <laughs> but we basically do a build-out in it, and the build-out this year was actually a Japanese whiskey bar, uh, similar to the Golden Guy. So you go in there, we've got a highball machine, we make your drinks back there, uh, and you have about 15 minutes. It's kind of something completely different, where it's an aspect where we see people in the dining room, or we see people at the bar who seem to be having a good time, they're pretty chilled out, we've got a really good connection with them, we're like, you want to come with us for five minutes, let us show you something. And we take them out and show them something that they've never seen before, they're never going to experience anywhere else in the world, and something that's completely unexpected. And the idea of like doing that as a creative process is just about taking risks and not being afraid to fail, and actually just making it fun for people. And then we do that for the staff as well, so one of our main things we have, which we introduced a couple of years ago, was bartender battles. So any member of staff is drawn out of a hat, and it's paired with either a head bartender, a bar manager, or a beverage director. And they'll work with them on a like, monthly basis to come up with a drink that's completely their idea. The only thing that like, the management structure is there to do is just guide them and give them like, help with balance. They then present the drink in front of the whole team at the end of the month. And the whole team will vote on it. And then the kind of management side will vote as well. And we'll have like, a people's choice winner and also uh, like, everybody else's winner. The idea with that was that we thought it was just going to be something that would be fun and allow the team to get involved. It actually... like kick-started this creative process that ended up with like eight drinks out of the whole menu for uh, out of like 12 for the, the summer menu being these drinks from these people. So it's incredible like what you can kickstart simply by the actual stuff that trickles down from the top and actually having belief in uh, the system that you have. Lovely, thank you. So Alex, I know you're um, a big fan of setting, uh, setting some time aside to create. What's your process like? Setting what? Setting time aside to create. Oh. Yeah. No, I think uh, it's uh, important. Uh, sometimes we are very busy, you know, uh, as a bartender. So uh, it's, uh, it's easy to be focusing on uh, uh, admin and uh, activities uh, which you do outside. I think it's very important uh, on weekly, monthly, whatever basis you like, uh, to set a time when uh, you switch off your phone and uh, you, you, you focus on working on, uh, or, or new projects, no? Mm. Uh, for me, uh, especially now, when uh, we don't have a bar, uh, we actually had to turn uh, a guest room in the house, uh, turn it into some sort of like a prep space where we can work on ideas. It's uh, very uh, frustrating, very different not to have uh, that base. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's beautiful to be outside of the job so we have more time to dedicate on the project. So it's about finding the balance. 
But for me, it's like, okay, now I'm gonna switch my phone. I don't care about anything. It's about prioritizing it, that you constantly do things. And sometimes it's a small thing, but if you do it uh, five minutes uh, every day, it's like learning a language, no? You learn your Spanish on the application. You do it every day 10 minutes. After a year, you know much more of Spanish. Yeah, definitely. And another thing that you um, spoke to me earlier about was uh, comparing comfort food and comfort cocktails. Well, basically this uh, idea was, this actually one of the graphics because obviously it looks like I'm the only one structured. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I made uh, at a conference in, uh, in Melbourne now a, a point about like, for me, uh, I always wonder where, what, is, what, is, uh, what is wrong with the ways how we, how we teach things. So I describe it on this graph, let me find it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you ask yourself, if you, if you try to explain cocktails to your sister who is not in the business, you know, it's easy to explain it, for example, on something like food. So uh, if you talk about comfort food, comfort food is first of all uh, comforting. It makes you feel safe. Uh, you know, it can have a huge uh, caloric, a uh, uh, lot of calories in it. Uh, the recipe is always standardized. It doesn't necessarily reflect time and the place. Uh, it has exact given number of ingredients. On the other hand, then on the, on the right hand of the spectrum, you have seasonal cooking, which changes daily. It's not standardized. You know, the, you, you need to tweak the recipe as you go because some of the ingredients might change. And it reflects the time, the place, what is it all about. And to me, uh, the classic cocktails, they sit right next to the comfort food, next to your burger, club sandwich, lamb chops. And I have a huge respect for both classic dishes and uh, classic drinks. But at the same time, if I go to Shanghai or Tokyo, you know, like uh, ordering a gin martini or, uh, or, or a burger is the last thing on my list. It's like uh, flying to Mexico, driving nine hours to Oaxaca, and then ordering a Brooklyn and a club sandwich instead of <laughs> diving into an uh, ocean of mezcal and tacos and beer, no? Yeah. So uh, the, the point I want to make is as the bartending world is moving towards the, the seasonal produce, the seasonal cooking, uh, with, with, with the drinks, we need to uh, change the way how we, uh, how we educate people about, about drinks, because up until now, we are learning historical data, five spirit categories, what happened to all the other spirit categories mm -hmm. in the bar school, no? And, uh, and you, 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 you learn like a proportions, no? What we need to be really teaching bartenders is why we're doing what we're doing, you know? Why do you put uh, sugar, alcohol, and ascorbic acid on the, on the veg of the, or, the, or the wheel of the orange when you're making dehydrated garnish, no? We, we, we need to, as the, as the bartending is changing, we need to start to learn uh, culinary techniques rather than uh, some like a recipe and having discussions about, you know, dietary ratios, no? We need to, we need to teach people why. Yeah, why are you doing what I agree doing? 100%. And I guess this thing is with the bar trade as well, it's like, an, it's always evolving. So Luke, I know that's a big thing for you is evolution in the workplace. Yeah, yeah. Um I think uh, for, for me, it's like a, I get bored very easily. So like if it's not always pushing forward or whatever, I, I get sick of it. And so I always th think like as well, if I'm not 100% invested in, into what I'm doing, how can I expect my staff to be as well? So like trying to keep everything fresh and moving forward for my staff. Um, so even down to like daily prep tasks, you know, because the, the bar is quite prep heavy. I, you know, we always rotate it so not the one person that's good at doing the, I don't know, the one garnish, you know, of the, doing this one frozen chocolate garnish. There's, there's one bartender that's really good at that, so he d or she just gets stuck with that all the time. No, like, you, you did it this week, so the next person does it the next week, and so they, they get to learn a variety of skills, um, even down to, like, you know, service-wise. So, like, you know, it's, I think... Uh, a lot of the time egos come into play in bars um, where it's just like you have the head bartender oh, he has to be the guy making the drink or the floor person she's just the floor or he's just the floor person you know I rotate that even as well so even like on any given night you'll have the head bartender or myself or whatever bar backing or whatever and it just keeps things fresh uh, and, and evolving so 
Um, yeah, I've always sort of said, like, the day that, like, if specific to Operation Dagger, the day that the Operation Dagger stops evolving and becomes stagnant is the day I'll be done with it. Um, whether that's going to be in two years, five years, 20 years' time, who, who knows? But, you know, we'll just continue to ride it as long as it's uh, evolving and, and progressing, and that, I think that's important. Yeah, so, um, so with creativity, there's obviously challenges that face everybody. And I know, Matt, you're, from, um, you're very much an a owner-operator. What sort of challenges do you face on a daily basis? I think um, there's, there's always challenges every single day. Every single service is different. Um, every single batch, we batch all of our drinks. Every single batch might be different because we use fresh produce. And the produce is not always the same. So there's always a challenge of we've just made a five-liter batch, but it might taste different than the week before, so we've got to try and fix this. Or how do we fix this before it actually happens? And there's always, there's always a challenge every single day, I think, to every service. Yeah, and you, Alex, as well, you're from a really large um, hotel group at the Artesian part of the Langham Group. What sort of challenges did you face? I think in the big, in the big organizations, you always uh, you know, spend a lot of time explaining yourself and uh, explaining uh, ideas. So for me, I think there was a, there was a big challenge. And I said it early on, you know, we used to write new menus five in the morning with our Nigerian cleaner hovering under my chair. Uh, it's good to take time for creativity, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it goes to the very first point which Nathan made, no? You, you need to sleep. I tried uh, for almost 10 years not to sleep and uh, the, the, the physical toll uh, is a very bad one. Uh, I'm very happy. My chiropractor is much more rich, uh, but you know, like... Yeah. Alex is only, like, 21, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's only because I drink uh, the dirty martini from Operation Dago, which makes me look so young. <laughs> what about you, Luke? It must be difficult for you spending half of your time away from Singapore and away from Operation Dago. Yeah, it can, it can be a challenge, and, and that's, like, back to, like, I have to have certain structures... Um, otherwise, yeah, it would be a nightmare. So um, even when I'm not uh, not in Singapore, we still have the weekly creative sessions. Um, we still have weekly uh, a, a Skype call with my, my head bartender there, or sous bartender. Um, and just we have like a, a working task sheet every week that we go towards, okay, what do we want to achieve this week? And it's always picked up. So even if I'm not there, it's still going through the same motions. It was really important for me to keep my team schedule and the bar's schedule uninterrupted, no matter where I am, because you know sometimes it's quite unpredictable where I, wherever I could be in the world, especially the last year, I was spending my time dividing between South Africa, Australia, uh, and Singapore, and then other random trips in between. So I really wanted to make sure that the bar was, even though my schedule was, was hectic, they were uninterrupted. So it still goes ahead every, every week, every Thursday, 4.30, creative session, everyone stops prep, um, and there's an hour and a half where they just focus on just ideas. And it's sometimes, like, not, like, ideas don't come from every session, but it might be, like, a, a, a progressive thing. Sometimes there's, like, four or five in one session. But, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it could be a challenge if I didn't have that structure. But, like, as I said before, I know that structure is probably not my strong point. So there's certain areas where... I have to be very strict with myself. Um, so if that means, you know, waking up at f four in the morning, if I'm in a different time zone to have that Skype call, I still, you know, make sure I do that. Sean, sure, tell us a little bit about the criticism that you face as well in terms of being creative, Luke. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I think it's, <laughs> uh, you always, I, I think it's, it's actually kind of a good sign. I think if you receive criticism because it means you're actually pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, if you, I always feel like if you're not going to receive criticism from everyone, then or from anyone, you're just making stuff to keep people happy, and you're just like you're just doing what's what's done before. So I actually, I actually like when people criticise stuff that I do. Um, I welcome criticism, like um, especially like in, you know, it, I don't expect everyone to love every drink that I make. I think that's an unachievable goal, you know, and. Um, but also at the same time, like I'm always very strong on, you know, and like Matt and I talk about it quite a lot, 
you know, just having confidence in what you're doing and, you know, realizing that, okay, if you want to do this, it doesn't matter what everyone else is doing or saying or whatever, you know, you're always going to do the same thing. You know, just recently I had, you know, uh, someone email me uh, direct sort of criticizing and actually, you know, asking questions and, and criticizing me about the way I, I sort of uh, present myself on social media and things like that. You know, I didn't, that criticism didn't make me change what I do. I won't change what I do, you know. Um, and I think that's probably one problem that I find in the industry. A lot of people are too concerned about what other people are doing and not caring about or not really focusing on what they're doing themselves. Um, yeah, you can, you can focus and criticise other people all you want, but like, just focus on what you're doing. It doesn't matter if this guy's doing classic drinks or pro progressive stuff and you might not agree what, what, with what they're doing. It doesn't make it wrong. It's just it's good that it's different. You know? I think variety is the spice of life. And if, if everyone was doing the same thing, it would be a pretty boring place. So. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on that, Alex? In terms yeah, of I think there's also a big difference between uh, criticism and constructive feedback. You know, when I have people at the, at the bar, if I speak with them after, I ask them for the negative things. You know, tell me the three things you hated or you didn't like about this drink, about this experience. That's where you can actually learn something from, you know, asking someone for positive feedback, you know, tapping you on the back, like you, you're never going to learn anything. You know, oh, yeah, I'm great. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I think, yeah, I think you, you, you need to get to the point. For me, it, it took very long time uh, to learn not to care because I, uh, I always feel that uh, I care about how people feel, what they think, and uh, at a certain point, and it took me many years, you need to arrive to the point, this is what I'm not this is what I'm doing. If you don't like it, uh, I don't give a fuck. And uh, it's very, it's, it's very, uh, it, it's, it makes you free. Uh, because last three years in my previous job, uh, I think everybody thought that I should be the most happy person in the world. Uh, I've been uh, almost two years now out of my job. I've never been more happy. And I do projects which sometimes uh, don't deliver anything financially, uh, but it's nice to have a nice beer or just spend a month in, a, in, in, in Amazon. Uh, so you do, do what makes you happy, no? Yeah, the, absolutely. I think also just add like having the confidence to stick with it as well. You know, I, I think I, I, it's such a shame when you see someone that has like a really good idea and it might not work straight away. And so then they just like give up on it or they'll change it and then it becomes like whether it's specific to a venue or whatever it is and all of a sudden you, you go back there three months later and you know instead of doing you know whatever they wanted to do they've now accommodated everyone and criticism of oh, okay we needed a tap beer in so we've got a tap beer in now and then uh, people were complaining that we weren't doing espresso martinis so we started doing espresso martinis then all of a sudden like your whole venue has changed and you, you've lost your identity yeah um, alex think you got something to add to that yeah also connected with this uh Years ago, I was uh, reading all this article on Medium everywhere, you know, you should be, you know, about strong online presence. So I uh, took a bunch of money, I made my logo, I made my website, and nah, nah, so many people criticized me. It brought me uh, so much more work and business, it's fantastic. Uh, and uh, it confirms <laughs> once again, you know, the, the thing is in this industry is the moment you get successful, people are very upset with you, you know, you, you, you make a brand, uh, you, 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 you make it big, you sell it to a big company, uh, why is everybody upset with you? Maybe that was your goal to make you happy. For somebody else, might be to have a small brand all their life, do it in their garage. Uh, you know, that's what they make them happy. I'm happy for both of them. Yeah, yeah. Nathan, is something you wanted to say? Yeah, I mean, I think this comes back again to fear. People are so scared shitless of doing anything that whenever people like Alex and stuff or Luke like take the plunge and are like, you know what, we're gonna do this, we're gonna stick it out, people automatically get offensive or get like kind of defend the idea of the aspect of what that should be it's kind of disappointing especially now where we've reached a point in social media where social media is controlling so much of it like it's incredible because without that we wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't be able to see all this what we're doing but there's also a negative aspect where when people are pushing forwards and like actually taking risks like big risks within a career uh, especially in this industry to have a negative connotation against that is really disappointing at points uh, and people put a lot of work into this stuff like a lot a lot of work and i don't I don't always agree with it in that kind of sense, and it's, I'm just happy that people are still willing to take risks and keep going pushing forwards. 
Yeah, that's the thing. That's something you brought up in the in the interviews was um, that you t end up taking quite a lot of risks personally. Yeah, I mean, for me, like whenever I was in a really good position, especially the merchant. Whenever I was there, we just won world's best bar in 2012, no, 2010, uh, and I left the following year. And then when I got to London, worked in Milk and Honey, and then went to Dandelion. Dandelion was an incredible project, like one of the best I could ever imagine working on. And that July, we won world's best new hotel, no, world's best new bar. And a month later, I was like, I'm done, I'm out. And the only reason why I did that was because I didn't foresee anything, not necessarily creatively, but I didn't foresee me being able to push on further in what I was doing. And I needed to kind of like break that mold uh, of comfortability just to be able to go and do something different. So I basically told, <laughs> basically, uh, told my wife, we're, uh, we're going to move, we're gonna move uh, countries. And two years ago, we uh, decided to set up in New York. To be able to do that is not only like a massive risk for us, because I don't really know anything about New York at this point. I didn't know anything about working in New York. Uh, I had to learn a whole different metric system, which was like basically <laughs> like, it was the hardest thing of all. Like nothing else was as hard as trying to learn ounces. I'm not even joking. Like it's like learning how to bartend all over again. Um, but there was also a massive financial risk in that. And it's like without being able to do that, I wouldn't be sat here today. And I also wouldn't have kept pushing and continually met different people. I wouldn't have worked in different cultures. And to be honest, maybe it's one of the best things I've ever done. And now, as I say, when I look at fear and when I look at change, I'm not afraid of it anymore. I actually like want it to come on. I want to bring it on every single time. Uh, and the company that I work with, I'm so fortunate, the fact that they're exactly the same and it kind of aligns very, very well. And it, it builds my confidence day in, day out. And that's why my creative aspects have been so good this year with like competitions as silly as they can be at times. Uh, it's allowed me to like really get stuck into different things and also have a real impact on the menu at the Nomad. So. Nice. So Matt, one of the other challenges, um, I guess, is about having a sense of urgency. And this is something that you don't think you need. I think if you, need a, if, if you need a drink for the menu that day, you're going to have to have a sense of urgency. But I don't think you should rush something to get something on a menu and put something out that doesn't represent what you do or, or put something on a menu that's shit. I, I would rather lose, lose a drink off a menu and serve nine for a night yeah. rather than put something on and have the urgency to, like, to rush something and, and actually not be proud of what you're serving. Yeah. I guess it must be quite a big thing for you, Alex, like being able to juggle so many projects that you must need to be pretty urgent. Yeah, I think uh, it's about learning, uh, and this is like from the one of the motivation books. So it's gonna suck, but like you need to prioritize what's important also for yourself and for your team and for your projects. It's one of the reasons why I haven't been getting really promptly to you, for example, for this seminar, because there was other things That's which very I had true, to actually, yeah. <laughs> which I had which I had to prioritize. I, you need to be, f you you just need to be f fine with that. Yeah. Uh, but I agree with Matt. Uh, you, you cannot compromise uh, your philosophy and your vision. Yeah. Lovely. So we're about to go into the section called Moving Forward. So, Alex, could you describe how you look to the future and stay away from drink, uh, from drink trends, which is something you've done over the last number of years in your career? And why is that important to you? Uh, I think all the drink trends uh, are nonsense and uh, <laughs> bullshit, which uh, the media needs. And uh, I think uh, there's a lot of people uh, are creating or pushing uh, trends because they need the media stories, probably. Uh, I think it's uh, good to be aware of what everybody else uh, is doing, but uh, at the same time, you should be focusing uh, on your own thing. And I think the, the, the best thing out there, even if you look at these three good-looking gentlemen next to me on my left, is like, they are all so different, and they're pushing their own thing. They don't necessarily care about what is the, uh, what, what is the trend. Uh, so it's about having your philosophy and sticking into it. I still believe that like, you shouldn't be ignoring things. It's good to be aware about what's going on, uh, but then kind of steering away from it. Yeah, what about you, Luke? Uh, yeah, I've, I didn't even know it. Like, I, th I think for me, it's, it's always been like if you're if you're doing your own thing or whatever and, and pushing something, you're like pushing it, to be on the other end of, if you want to call it drink trends, to be on the other end and to be like the person that starts that trend sort of thing, yeah. rather than following Because if you're just following what other, other people are doing, then it's, you're just going to be churning out the same stuff. And, and you always follow, huh? you never lead. That's what, yeah. Albert Adria, that's what Albert Adria told me once. You yeah, know? If you always follow what everybody else is doing, you will always only be, you're always catching up. 
Yeah. You, you never go your own way. Yeah. I, I'm actually always like, uh, you, you might, I might have an idea or whatever, and then I'll, uh, I'll be talking to Matt or I'll see, he, he will like, <laughs> have, he'll, re, he'll do it before me and I'm like, oh fuck, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> And like I'll say to, you know, someone will come to me with an idea for whatever it is. I'm like, no, we can't do that because Matt's done that. So, you know, make a point of, of not doing the same thing, you know. Um, and I think it, it, it's only uh, the end result is just, yeah, it's something different, something new. And, yeah. And I guess that ties in quite nicely to one of your biggest things, Matt, is open book creativity. Yeah, I actually, I actually believe that we should share all of our information that we've ever, ever uh, put out. All cocktails come from somewhere, but we've all got recipes that we've all got locked behind passwords, and and we're so scared of any other bartender copying us. And I actually think we should just open up all of our recipes and share all of our information. And actually, you can see what someone else has done. The young bartenders then get to learn from us, and the, the industry moves forward because people have more information. Yeah, and it's something you feel quite passionately about, Nathan, as well, right? Yeah, I mean, this is this last year we had actually Alex and Monica come and work with us, our stage with us for a full week, um, which is incredible. Like they paid their own way to get there, like spent the week in New York with us, uh, off their own bat, and they basically got fully immersed in every single thing we do, right down to being like a kitchen server, being a bar back. He went and worked with a prep team for a week. who come in at like 8 a.m. in the morning to do like most of the prep and juicing. Uh, they worked behind the bar with us for a night. Like it was, it was incredible. But the idea between this was just the fact that we don't want to hide anything. Like at Nomad, we're completely open to like anybody. If you want to know something, I'll tell you. You want to know that spec, I'll give you every single detail of it. You want to know the prep behind stuff? You want to come see behind the bar? Like we've shared our bar designs with people. Like. Every single aspect of it is open. And um, the only reason why is because we don't really have anything to hide. And as well, the more people that know it and the more people we share it with, the more opportunity there is for other people to grow, which then means if there's competition or there is like other people doing stuff, it pushes us on further. And it just makes us want to be even better. It makes us want to do things that are completely different all over again and just allows for reinvention. Nice. So Luke, like, do you ever feel a responsibility towards your guests in terms of your creations? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I think uh, at the end of the day, that's the main thing: is that their guests coming, uh, guests are coming, and, and they're happy, and uh, you're delivering an experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a big thing for me. I mean, even for me, from from my own personal, you know, experiences, like going, you know, to restaurants or bars or whatever. It's it's more than just about the drink. It's about the the overall experience and whatever. And I always like to deliver that for anyone coming to, to my place. So yeah, it is a responsibility. And like, it, it's, it's, uh, it's basically a, a, a policy of ours at Dagger, like um, it's quite structured in the service. You know, once you get a drink, the, the bartender will come and ask you, hey guys, how are your drinks going? If someone says, man, this dirty martini sucks, then we were like, okay, cool. Well, obviously we didn't get that right, like talking to you and it's not the right drink for you. Let's, let's get another drink. I think it's a win-win scenario. Yeah, okay, you might have to, you know, comp that drink at the end of the night, but at the end of the day, they're going to leave happy rather than going, yeah, I went to Operation Dagger once, had this dirty martini, it was shit house. Like, I'm not going there again. Whereas rather than, oh, yeah, I went to Operation Dagger, I had this dirty martini, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't my thing, but then, like, I told them, and then I had this other drink, and, yeah, it was, it was really cool. So, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's a win-win. So, um, Alex, like, why do you feel creativity is beneficial to you and your business? It's like Nike, you know? You constantly reinvent yourself. Every three months, new sneakers. You have, uh, you have things to talk about, no? It, uh, I think uh, there was no product or no brand, uh, no cocktail bar, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which was always doing the same thing and was successful, no? Uh, you can uh, look at uh, El Bulli, Noma, uh, Eleven Madison Park. Uh, it evolves. It keeps. Uh, it keeps interesting, and uh, I think it uh, stimulates you. you no, know? it gives you sort of uh, energy. At least for myself, like you're doing new things. It makes me very excited. Nice. So, Luke, I know that you've um, brought creativity essentially to a new uh, new category in a new market. Please, can you um, tell everybody why? Um, about your experience in South Africa and why it ended up turning out to be an inspiration for you. Yeah, so uh, for a year last year I had a project uh, called Outrage of Modesty. Um, so it was a bar in Cape Town. Um, 
and yeah it was it was such a cool experience like even now I mean the bar's still open now I'm no longer involved but uh, just the people I met and the experiences I had first of all were like amazing if you if you guys ever have the chance to get to K-Town you have to um, but then more importantly like it, it opened up another door so it actually I, I was in Singapore for a while with with Dagger and that was my focus for so long was Operation Dagger that I kind of, I guess, lost sight a little bit of what I really wanted to do. And going to Cape Town, it actually re-awoke me again to what I want to do, and that's to go back to Australia, which is what I'm working on now, this next project in, in Melbourne. Um, because I went to South Africa, and all of a sudden I had these native ingredients to work with, um, things I haven't tasted before, and it was just totally new. Everything was new. And... Uh, it was really cool for me, you know, like I found myself over the bar educating South Africans about South African ingredients and they were like blown away, like, you know, saying to me, you know, jokingly, like, I can't believe it took an Aussie to come all the way to South Africa to in introduce us to native, you know, stuff. And that's, I, all of a sudden I found myself like, oh, this is, this is what I want to do. Like, I'm, like, that's, so, because Singapore, I mean, Singapore's great for a lot of things, but there's not a lot of, indigenous native stuff in Singapore. It's, it's coming from Malaysia or whatever, and there's not a lot of fresh produce and whatever. It can be quite frustrating sometimes. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's why I was like, okay, cool. I know what I want to sort of move on to now. So it was, yeah, it was quite ironic that it took me to get all the way over to South Africa to realize actually I want to be back in my home country doing stuff. Um, so it was cool, it opened up that door again and, 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 and now this new project's um, which will be sort of coming to life in the next couple of months is, uh, is really exciting for me. Yeah. What about you, Alex, as somebody who's always working with uh, people in different fields? I think we had a very similar experience in Amazon. We'd done the same uh, kind of trip in uh, Lebanon. Uh, and uh, it was like, at the beginning, all the Lebanese bartenders, they're like, why the fuck do you want to come here to work with like, a Lebanese produce? And uh, it was a revelation for both of us uh, and uh, for all of us. And I think it's also sometimes the cultural preconceptions and the ability of shifting the perspectives because if you come from a different culture to somewhere like Lebanon, uh, you are excited by everything. You don't know things. And uh, yeah, I agree with Luke points. Probably very similar experience, but different. So Nathan, um, tell me a little bit, well, how do you feel about imitators? Do you feel it's a loss of integrity for the imitator? Or do you feel happy about inspiring people? I don't really care. I just like, when it, comes, when it comes to imitators, I'm just like, good for them in the fact that at least I'm doing something that they're paying attention to. Uh, and I'm happy actually, because part of it's like, you know what, if I, can, if I can give inspiration to someone where they're gonna like use something or like take an idea that I've done before, that's pretty cool. Uh, it doesn't really bother me overall personally. Like I'm not, as I say, I share everything. I'm open about everything that I do. I'm really happy to give any information out. Um, as I say, I'm just happy to be inspiring others if it works. What, what do you think, Luke? Yeah, I think uh, it's pretty hard to come up with like a 100% original idea. Like, let's be honest. Like, who's, who's ever had like a like, who's invented a light bulb in this room? You know, no, like no one. It's everything's been done before. It's going, you know, it's a, it's a matter of like where you get your inspiration from. You know. I think a big thing for me is credit your inspiration you know, and where you're getting that from. You know, say, okay, we've taken this technique that was developed by a, a restaurant or, or the chef. Um, you know, that's what I always try and make a big point of um, and for my staff to, you know, make sure that we're telling people, okay, this is, you know, it's not all of us. You know, yeah. it's not all. You know, we're, we're just, you know, whether it's basic, you know, fermentation techniques or like, you know, garnish techniques or whatever it is. You know, if you've taken it from somewhere, reference it, but also put your own twists on it and make it your own at the same time. There's nothing wrong with referencing it, yeah. uh, where you've got it from. Like one of Matt's menus uh, that, he, that he did at Peg and Patriot was really cool. It was like each drink was based around a, a well-known chef, you know, and giving inspiration there, whether he's taking a technique or the flavor combination or, or whatever. I think it's really cool. And it's, uh, again, it fits in with his open book sort of style of saying, look, this is where the ideas are coming from. I'm not going to sit here and go, yeah, these are all my ideas. Nice. Yeah, could you elaborate a bit further on that, please, Matt? I think 
as a as a team we had at Peg and Patriot at the time, we were all we were all striving to to introduce new ways of, of making cocktails and or extracting flavour out of essentially food. Um, and we we're all in we we're all foodies, we we're all inspired by chefs. And it was like how can we how can we bridge the gap between bartenders and chefs? Because we're essentially becoming much closer together as an industry. Um, and it was it, we didn't necessarily take reference from a dish. Some, sometimes we did, but it was more about the way that they go about their business, how they run their restaurant, or a dish that you might have tried in their restaurant. It was what inspires you as a person. And every single person in the team had three cocktails, and they were all matched to a chef. So they, they had the responsibility to, to showcase that chef in the best light with, with, on our menu. Nice. And Alex? Yeah, when it comes to the imitated the whole thing, like uh, every year our team we go and uh, we uh, we stash somewhere. Uh, and I, I remember a few years ago we've been in uh, Barcelona uh, with uh, Albert and Ferran Adria, and uh, I never forget this moment. After uh, at the end of the trip, we are saying goodbye, and uh, Albert gives me a hug and says, uh, "Anything you seen here? Anything you learn? Just." feel free uh, to use and uh, then we uh, we walking over uh, Plaza España with Simone and I said fuck they are always so ahead that they are willing to give you absolutely everything else because by the time you get here they again here and uh, and I think this this talks a lot about the originality and not caring because we all have uh, different paths and uh, as we crossed the square, that very moment we said, we need to leave. And that was, I think, uh, three years before we actually left the bar. Yeah. It was a lot of time to build up the courage to go. Yeah, yeah. And so, guys, um, thank you very much for sharing that. We're going to start doing some audience questions. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Um, to be honest, if you don't mind, I'd like to answer that question. I'm still working in a restaurant bar. Um, and, it, and for me, it's still very much like an underappreciated category globally, you know? Like we talk about looking up to chefs in the industry, but the people who work in restaurant bars are very much getting able to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's even small things like learning how to sharpen knives, flavors, and even the sort of uh, mindset that chefs have, you know? It's all about finding the best, doing the best, like dedication, persistence, all driving towards goal, things that you often don't see very much. And um, I think, I guess bartending shift is something that can almost be rival to a stage, but that's all ultimately about self-promotion, where a stage is you go, you learn, and you try and take as much as possible from that environment. You know, in Singapore, we've got some 19-year-old uh, like chefs who are very much at an early stage in their career, and they save up as much as they can, they don't do anything, and then they'll go and fly over to Norway, fly over to Copenhagen and spend as much time as possible and really invest in their own career is that Nathan yeah I think as well with the United States is very very lucky the United States has a Colony Institute and the Colony Institute kind of changes everything as far as a uh, demographic so when you're in the Colony Institute as a chef you have the opportunity to go on stage at these restaurants which basically is covered by the actual well it's covered by the Colony Institute but it allows you to go and have an insight into the restaurants and depending on what you want to do it gives you a real kind of background into the type of chefing that you want to do I think one of the problems that we're missing in our industry is that we don't really have any of those systems in place. So people don't necessarily know how to approach people. People are also fearful of actually asking like the likes of Matt, Luke, or Alex when his bar opens, like, can I come and work in your bar? Can I come and see what the systems are? Because it's got to the in the industry has got so long where it's like this closed book kind of method where it's like we can't tell you anything. Anything that we do here is completely secret. And that's part of the reason that the industry needs to kickstart itself where like it has to become more open. Once it becomes more open, people will actually like approach people about this. People will start asking questions. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this seminar today was like to actually speak to people and show them that it's really important moving forwards that we actually do allow people to do this and it's just about mentoring and the industry needs a lot more of that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh sorry. sorry. Sorry Luke, go on mate. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> In, in, in my experience, uh, so we, with Operation Dagger in Singapore, it's something that we've looked into quite a bit. Um, one negative thing that's made it very hard, anyone that's worked or, or owned and operated a business in Singapore, getting visas and things like that is like a real problem. It's mm. super hard. I actually had a friend of mine deported from Singapore 
when we opened Dagger. He came over and he just wanted to work and, and whatever. And yeah, he got deported. Like, it sucked. He can't come back to Singapore. Um, we're still looking into it. My big thing though as well is a lot, I, I do get quite a few emails from people saying like, oh, can I come work in your bar for a week or whatever? Uh, for my, my whole thing is, uh, what are you gonna learn in a week? I, and then my response usually is, yes, we do accept star, stagiaires, um, but you come for a three month block. For, you come for a whole menu change. And because then I think you'll take the most from it. Um, and I think that's where you'll, you really, um, uh, you know, that's what I'd love to do. But obviously that, that's challenging for a lot of people as well. They can't spend, you know, three months away from their job as, as well. So there's some challenges there as well. Um, the, but yeah, I 100% I agree. I think there should be more of it. Yeah. Totally. But how come, the, how come the chefs or the young cooks can do it and we cannot do it? That's my question. I think we used to have every week, you know, emails, or oh, can I come and spend time with you? And I think the point of the stash also, what we never take in consideration, is all the, the relationship is not only about taking, but also you need to give something back. So in order to be able to understand, learn someone's philosophy, you actually also need to work, to, to, to give something back. Because if I have you on the shift working with me, you're slowing down my stuff, my prep, I have to have more people on the shift to teach you, I need to have people to spend time with you, pick you up in the morning, take you for the breakfast or you for the coffee. So we need to start to give more as a bartender. Yeah, and I think it ultimately as well comes down to career investment. I find less and less people are less willing to invest in their own career you know, spend some money, go on trips, go and experience different cultures, things like that. Because everybody thinks that the brands will g give it to us, you know. Even in US, you know, you get sent on a trips through uh, USBG or something. In fact, it's the brands paying for us. You know, the question is, at the end of the month, this was your income. What is the amount of the money you invest back into yourself, you know? Did you pay for yourself to go for a financial course? I did this year. It was thousands of pounds. But I know I'm better at finance now than I was two years ago. I think it's a great idea. Maybe, maybe there needs to be a, a proposal to brands to sponsor this sort of thing. You know, star share programs around the world. I think that would be an amazing thing. Not for the yeah. bars, but also the brands as well. Um. Take the mic. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you've spoken a lot about creativity and menu development. Um, cocktails specifically, um, can you talk a little bit about um, creativity uh, and how you manage your respective programs, how you hire, um, and if you take you know, the same approach to, to you know, rethinking how those things uh, work um, in an industry that has you know, pretty much done the same thing and uh, maybe needs a little more diversity. Sure. Is, is there anyone you'd like to aim a question towards? No, uh, I guess Matt yeah. is the is the owner here, but um, yeah. I think everybody runs programs and does hiring I think and when we things. when we uh, when we're hiring a new member of the team, it's more about whether they whether they fit in with our, our guys. I don't really care if they've got any experience. I actually prefer if, they, if people have no experience. It's more about come and come and work with us on a shift, and do you fit in with our team? Are you are you a team player? Do you do you crack jokes? Do you have fun on shift? Are you a hard worker? And that's more important to me than if you are creative. We can, we can unlock that in you by giving you confidence to do it. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Matt on that one. Like um, maybe about a year ago, we hired a bartender with zero experience, was purely based on um, his attitude and his mentality. And he actually used to work in kitchens before that. So he was obviously a, a great candidate for a bartender anyway. And it's just being able to have things from a different perspective as well is amazing. Like as bartenders, we get taught to press our citrus this one way, but instead he took like his no experience approach. So now with our citrus at Tippling Club, we juice it fresh, we add salt in, which preserves it for two days anyway, and then we vac it so there's no, uh, no oxidization. It's just, for me, I've been doing this 11 years, and I've never come across that before. I thought it was genius. And um, that is just so ultimately so finding the right person. Down here is my bar manager from Scout Allen. He started working with us two years ago and he never worked in the bar industry. And now he's my bar manager, he brews beer for us, he, he ferments a lot of fruits, and he's like taking what we do to another level by actually caring about what he does. He's ran the lab for us and he's actually taught himself. Like I've given him the, the props and I've taught him enough to get him to where he needs to be, but he's actually ran with it himself. Cool. So 
I have a question. Sorry, he's next to me, so I was like, sure. just grabbing the mic. Um, I have a question towards Luke. So you spoke about uh, the idea of working in Singapore. Uh, my, my past life is in arts management, so I'm really interested in that, the idea of the Singaporean identity. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the idea that what you're doing for your bar program has helped to develop um, this notion of the Singaporean identity and the, this, this culture. Uh, it's um, a big question. <laughs> yeah, it's one thing that actually makes me quite proud to to consider that what I've done and 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 Operation Dagger, you know, contributing to that and different young Singaporeans. So like, basically, years ago there was my first introduction to Singapore was through Tipling Club, um, through the bar that I was at in in Melbourne. We ran like an exchange sort of thing, and I was the first person to go over. And then characters like uh, Zach Degit and Tor Burquist would go over who, you know, uh, are now, you know, running really great programs around the world. Zach's still in Singapore. Um, and then I came back to Melbourne and, and then went back again for, to Operation Dagger, started that. And then in, in between that, there was like, you know, 28 Hong Kong Street had opened up, uh, I think Cufflink Club, Tipling was still there. And those guys sort of laid the groundwork for me to come in and do something quite different. If you asked me like in 2009 to do Operation Dagger, because the idea was there, if you asked me to do that in 2009, there's no way I would have done it. Like it just wouldn't, have, it would have failed in a second because it just, the scene wasn't there. But because of these other bars being there, it enabled me to come in and do that. And now fast forward, you know, five years later, right? Um, or four years later, uh, I've got like, We've got now one of the most exciting bars in Singapore, uh, in Native, who's v run by VJ, um, who used to work with me at Dagger. You know, he worked with me at Dagger for two years. Um, and then he's, he's taken what he's learned there and then gone and opened his own space. And this is really exciting space and he's doing something that's very unique. Obviously the, the influence of Dagger has been there, but he's made something new and it's, uh, it, ma it makes me really proud. It's really cool to see. And that's actually what I've, my focus has sort of shifted now in Singapore to be like not so uh, internally focused on oh, let's make Operation Dagger like the best it can be. Obviously, we still want to do that, but I just want to have like an influence on on on, on younger Singaporeans because it is a very Singapore's crazy now. It's such a crazy bar scene. It's like exploded, and it now rivals like people talk about it all the time now it rivaling London and New York and things, which is a crazy sort of ideal or concept for me because it's like so young and there's still so much to, to learn. Who are you laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's come so far so, so quickly. So I can imagine like in another five years what, what's going to happen. And I think Singapore is changing a lot now. It's not like a heap of expats now opening bars. It's now guys like VJ that are opening their own thing. It's really cool. And Singapore only now I think is starting to develop its own own identity and I, I look forward to who knows you know in five years time when I'm maybe I'm not even doing something in Singapore going back and seeing a heap of you know Singapore run owned and operated venues okay. um, so I, I run uh, a couple of bars and restaurants myself and I consult for other folks and I've been in your bars my, my question is uh, uh, how do you control and channel the process from, from two perspectives, and one is cost, and, and the other is kind of maintaining a unified vision of the place. And so I, I went to a consulting job once, and I came the next day, got a whole staff who, you know, excited about creativity, and one of their new bartenders who's been a bartender for about a week and a half, it's like I was, I was experimenting with some stuff, and there was a liter of cognac gone and half a liter of Quantro gone. I was like, you've been a bartender for two weeks, you don't get to play with the, the cognac yet. Um, and so, how do you channel that and make sure that the costs are controlled? That every bartender isn't, you know, going through the spirits every night to come up with something. And I also really try to avoid the, my places. Oh well, I was in on, on Tuesday and Jimmy tried a new drink out on me, but it's Thursday and Sally's behind the bar and she doesn't know what the hell Jimmy was doing. What kind of rules do you put in place to control that process and have a unified vision? I think we touched on it uh, earlier, and from my own perspective, it's again the education, because we teach uh, bar young bartender completely wrong things, you know. How many of you in the bar school learn how to cost the recipes? How many of you uh, been taught uh, about PL sheets? 
how many of you, uh, you know, like if, if you are a young culinary student, you realize that everything in the kitchen is designed for health, sta uh, safety, efficiency. Uh, the, the button, you learn completely things. So I think, yes, there, there needs to be more systems. And uh, it's often uh, down to uh, things like the databases which Matt has. And I think uh, he should be the perfect person to uh, answer this, because he has a very tight uh, thing and control system uh, that they develop uh, to do that. And uh, it's not the fault of the kids that they wasted the uh, half battle of control and the other thing. Uh, it's, again, the fault of the management. Uh, they, they should have never been in that position in, in, in the first place. So it all comes down uh, to, to, to the training and having a structured way of what happens, you know. You start, as, for me, you start always as a, as, a, as a barbecue. You come, first thing you need to learn is the philosophy. What are the ethos of the place? You know, why are we doing this thing we're we, we, we doing? Once you are able to answer all of these questions, then you move forward. Then you need to learn all the preparations we're doing. Only uh, many months later, you're actually moving behind into, into operation. So I think it's about having uh, tight systems and, and a structure. Tell us about the, the website you have. It's amazing. I've seen it. I think for, for the website we've got, Alan actually built it. He's a, an, he's a coder, and he built the, the website for us. And we still we're looking to keep developing it and keep improving the website. Um, but for us, it's about understanding the cost of every single thing you put in your drinks. And I think as an industry, we actually make pretty good margins on our cocktails. And for me, for the staff to be creative, if I lose 5% a month on the team being creative, I don't care. I'd rather come into the bar and be excited about everything we serve and lose 5% because everyone's being creative in that month than actually drive profit and be bored with what we do. Yeah, and I think to answer part of your question as well, I think um, on the consistency side, we invest so much time in consistency of products, ingredients to be able to deliver something truly unique. Consistency should be able to be taught from those early days as well. So you give them 100, 150 cocktails, majority of them classics, old drinks, and then if they've got that tool, there should be no other reason why they have to make things up and, and go along with that. Because like you said, that guest will come in the next day and then just be really disappointed. It affects the whole experience of your venues because somebody was playing around when necessarily they shouldn't have been. You know? I think too, like you're talking about, you know, like a bartender coming in after two weeks and using a whole bottle of cognac. It's like, yeah, it's, it's moronic. Um, for us, uh, like our creative sessions, sometimes they're not really that hands-on. It's just all theory, you know. And, you know, I always think that if it works, it's got to work first on paper before you actually start trying things. And then when you start trying things, you don't start, like, dive into the, di like, all at once and use a whole bottle of cognac, you know. Just, just use, you know, 50 mils or 100 mils, do a test batch, test that, scale the recipe down. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually pretty easy to, to control it. You just need to, uh, to rope people in. And um, yeah, the big one for us is just yeah, making sure it's like you have those sessions that aren't hands-on and more theory-based first. So guys, I think we've got time for one last question. Payman? Start with you, Alex. Uh, for me, the biggest inspiration or a person uh, lately been uh, Virgilio Martinez. Uh, our team was uh, lucky to done a couple of uh, gigs with him now, and uh, like exploring uh, the, the richness of Peru uh, fauna and flora. That's like uh, affected me to the extent that actually I would love to live in Peru. I'm gonna do it. question I don't know uh, I mean there's so much stuff going on in the world all the time and I think it's uh, not necessarily I mean like bartending wise like bars you know I'm I'm, I'm really love what, what Matt's doing I'm like I'm, I'm the biggest fan of, of, of his stuff um, and then Alex uh, no, 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 I was the biggest fan <laughs> um, but yeah like I, I, I my my big thing at the moment is uh, that's inspired me is actually not involving bartending at all. It's actually spending time with family and things like that, going back to Australia um, and just finding that work-life balance again. Um, I just recently... I, there was a, a, a 
the best example I can think of actually is there was a, an amazing symposium in, in Melbourne just now. Alex came down for it called Grow and there's some really interesting people, not just from the food and beverage industry, but other industries coming down and giving talks and whatever. And I really wanted to go. But I had one day before flying to New Orleans that I could meet my nephew who's one year old and I hadn't met him yet from the States. He was flying over. So... I decided no, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna go and see Alex at Grow, even though I know I'm gonna be missing out on a lot of stuff. I, I spent my day the day with the family, you know. So I think that's that for me is like putting things into perspective at the moment, and uh, that's been that's been my inspiration at the moment. I think for for me at the moment is with opening Scout, like driving around or cycling around the streets of London and actually seeing the wealth of produce that's available on the street. Um, you'll be like unbelievably surprised the amount of fruit and nuts and seeds that you can get off the streets and the guys are constantly coming in with like big bags of plums and apricots and almonds cherries and it's and actually it's free food for us we don't we, a, a kilo of cherries in london is like 10 pounds and we get we're getting seven kilos for nothing from from a, two trees in bethnal green and to yeah no, <laughs> so and uh, but it means that we don't have to charge as much we can actually spend more time being creative we can actually we can push out what our business more because we're not actually we're saving money in other places. Mine actually is the, probably the most complete random out of place one of all. Nike actually, re, sorry, Nike actually recently just did a, a project called Moonshot, which was basically they took the top three marathon runners in the world who had hit different times, and they put them on a track in Monza in Italy. And the idea was that they were hoping, in the hope they designed the shoe that was specially like, paired to these runners, they were going to try and get as close, if not break the two-hour mark in a marathon, which according to science is 75 years off. And it's a gentleman called Ilag Kipcho who uh, managed to do it in two hours and 25 seconds. So he's 25 seconds off, and the media kind of like had a little bit of a backlash to it and looked, like, criticized it a little bit. And he said, well, you know what? I'm only 25 seconds off. I'm not 25 minutes, I'm 25 seconds towards reaching that goal and being closer. And it was something very, very clever whereby even if Nike had told him to do this or say this at that point, he turned around something that came across as such a negative connotation into something so positive. It's kind of like refreshing to see that. And that was like, it's been a big inspiration for me this year is to see things like that where there's been a lot of positivity around um, and just take something from that which is completely out of uh, place as far as like bartending and having something completely different. Yeah, for me, um, we're very lucky at the moment at Tipling Club to have a relationship with a company called IFF. It stands for International Flavors and Fragrances, and these guys are known worldwide for multi-sensory experiences. Like anything that you'd ever go into a convenience store and buy, like soap, chocolate, sweets, whatever. Um, one of these handful of companies would have touched that. So we recently launched a menu called the Sensorium Menu, where it's 12 perfume blotters, each with their own memory, trigger, and aroma at the end. And actually, I probably should have mentioned it earlier when I went through the gifts. My gift uh, to the room was if you actually smell the, the back of the pamphlet, that's the smell of rain. So being able to work with a team like that, you know, it's, it's very much like a relationship experience. They gave us ideas for some of the drinks ingredients, and we helped them with some of their projects. Like, they started developing a rain shampoo now. You know, and they, yeah, just working with those guys on a day-to-day -day basis is just it's inspiring. So... And as we draw to a close, I was actually going to use a quote from Pablo Picasso to finish, but believe it or not, Luke came up with a better quote. <laughs> so over to you, Luke, if you can remember it. Quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's talking about, like, I, I, I think, like, don't put the four or five of us on, on, on a pedestal and say, like, we're the creative ones. I think it's stupid, like... Uh, you know, but also don't don't have like uh, don't be scared to like come up to any one of us. I think um, and just ask about whatever it is that's on your mind, or or if like if if yeah if you're interested, or even if you think we're all full of shit, just come and talk to us as well. <laughs> we'll e we'll either agree with you or tell you to fuck off. So it's fun. Um, but I think that's like Matt was saying, like an open book. You know, everyone should be a lot more sort of. Uh, 
have an open book policy about creativity and, and yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I'd just like to say it's, it's a huge uh, honour for me to be up here with these guys, like, because these guys around me, I consider such creative individuals and I'm constantly learning every day from these guys and uh, more importantly to me is, like, I've, I've established some really good friendships within this group of guys too, so... Um, I wouldn't have got that if I didn't have the balls to, you know, go up and, and talk to any of them at the start. So, yeah, that's my quote, I guess. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> yeah. Nailed so, it. Yeah, so everybody, thank you so much for coming. Thank you to the panel and the sponsors as well for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you.